Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child, Wells Fargo, the Adler Aphasia Center, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work. And by Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868. This is One on One. That's good acting, man. <laughs> I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to One on One. I want to introduce you to one of the many health and medical experts we have who joins us on a regular basis. He is Dr. David Singh. He is an interventional radiologist at Holy Name Medical Center, who also heads up the Interventional Institute there, right? Yes, correct. Thank Which you. has been in existence for eight years. Eight years, the holy name. You've been there for the last three, last heading three. it up? Yep. Let, let, me, let me ask you, this is interesting. The Interventional Institute, what is it and why is it so significant? Well, in the Interventional Institute is just a, the name of our where we practice. Um, my director, Dr. Bunback, he sort of started that eight years ago. Um, the significance of it, it's, it, it lends credence to our, our the importance of the re interventional radiology services in Brigham County and also in New Jersey, um, the type of procedures we do. So whenever we reach out to the public, um, it's a way of separating the IR section, interventional radiology section, in holy name from the rest of the sur sur surgical services that are present within the hospital. And the IR piece, the interventional radiology piece is huge. Now, the, we've talked to some of your colleagues uh, in this field, but I want to separate your piece out. Yep. Women's health, right? Can we focus on that in this program? Sure. What are the key IR, interventional radiology, issues as it relates to women's health that are so important to our audience right now? Okay. Well, the main ones we deal with the Holy Name are uterine fibroid embolization. Or uterine, you, say it again. Uterine fibroid embolization. Go ahead. Or it's also called uterine arterial um, intervention. What are we, we talking about in English? In English, women with growths in the uterus that cause them to have dysfunctional bleeding or pelvic pain. Historically, these were treated with surgery, either mm. hysterectomy or myomectomy. In women in, that don't want to have a surgical option and prefer a less invasive option, this is essentially a procedure where we devascularize those tumor growths. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The, one of the other things about our health and medical series is every time a phrase or a word get, get, gets used that I'm pretty confident our audience doesn't mm -hmm. know, I jump in. Say that word again. Devascularize. Devascularize, yes. which is? Well, in plain English, layman's terms, basically you have a tumor that requires blood. Right. and the vascular part of it. So when you remove that blood, you devascularize it. So by cutting off the blood supply to the growth, you, you, because of that, you, you infarct or kill right. the growth, reducing the symptoms she has to begin with. And it's so interesting, your field has grown tremendously. Uh, this uh, fibroid embolization yes. is huge. How is it helping women um, and by the way, what was done before that even existed? Well, just to give you a back about fi with fibroids, are li they're also called leiomyomas. Um, so fibroids are growths in the uterus, and about 30% of women have these growths. Not all women are symptomatic. Um, historically, the treatments for these growths have been surgery, hysterectomy or myomectomy. And the post-operative recovery period is much longer with any kind of surgical intervention. Now, with technology came ways of doing things that don't require big incisions. And uterine artery embolization is a procedure whereby we access the arterial supply to the uterus via the groin. So right. if you feel your groin, your right groin, you feel a pulse. We, we enter the femoral artery, causing that pulsation in the right groin, with a small needle. And through that needle, a single opening, we advance a small catheter, which is no bigger than a spaghetti, into the uterine arteries, and we inject particles the particles then flow and they stop the blood supply 
to the fibroids and also slow the blood supply to the uterus. Now the recovery period has to be dramatically different? It's dramatically different. Describe it. So the procedure take, takes about half hour to 45 minutes to perform. That's it? That's it. Um, so once the procedure is finished and the blood supply to the fibroids is, is stopped, um, she will then begin to have some form of symptom. We call this post-embolization syndrome, whereby she has pain, cramps, um, just by cutting off the blood supply. Your body, in response to no blood coming in, sends a signal to your brain and she has cramps. That's effectively controlled with pain medication, some form of narcotic. Um, she goes home either that same day with pain medication or she's admitted overnight into the hospital with pain medication. She'll be on pain medication for the next three days uh, and then by a week later she's back to the normal activity. Two things. By the way, I want to clarify, the, the director of the uh, Interventional Institute is... Dr. Rumbeck. Because I, you are part of that team. Yes. But he is the director. Yes. Uh, clarify something else. The risks associated with the embol embolization process, what are they? So the main one, if anyone do a literature, literature search on it online, would be something called non-target embolization. Non-target embolization. embolization. What it, that means is basically my intent is to embolize the uterine artery. If those particles I inject go someplace else, it's non-target. You need a significant amount of particles in a different vessel to mm -hmm. cause the blood flow in that vessel to stop. So non-target embolization is something we really don't see a lot of. The reason being is, the uterine artery has a very distinct appearance, and with the amount of procedures we do, you're comfortable when you're in it. So when you inject the particles, you use x-ray dye to see where the particles are going. So the only way you'll have a case where there's non-target embolization is if you just don't know what you're doing, or if you're you just not paying attention. you got to get the right attention. target. Yes, but the target is so distinct that mm. it's done pretty much across the country. Doctor, in the time we have, help us some understand something else. IR, mm -hmm. right? What other ailments, what other medical conditions is, in fact, um, interventional radiology useful in helping, particularly as it relates to women? Well, pelvic congestion syndrome in women's health is another area we focus pelvic on. Pelvic congestion, congestion syndrome. syndrome. Go ahead. Two couple words in there. One, it's um, pelvic, and obviously it's a disorder of the pelvic congestion, um, a backup. And um, essentially what this is is a disorder of the, the veins in the pelvis these veins become engorged, sort of like varicose veins in the leg. They become engorged, mm. resulting in a heaviness, a sensation of heaviness and fullness in the pelvis. Um, medical workup are oftentimes negative as a, for, as a cause for it. The appendix are, is normal, the bowel is normal, so oftentimes primary care physician may be left scratching their head. Like you can't see, you did you the test, see because I don't there see anything. Because there are engorged veins in the pelvis. So what, essentially what we do is we decrease the inflow of blood into the pelvis by embolizing the veins causing the pelvic congestion syndrome. Those are usually uh, the ovarian veins, the veins going to the ovary. When you uh, got into medicine, mm -hmm. right, into this field, did you ever imagine these, this technology would be available to you? Um, no, uh, you know, I actually entered <laughs> medical school wanted to do primary care, be a primary care physician and internist. Right. And uh, once I saw my first CAT scan and my first MRI, and using imaging, those same imaging modalities and x-ray, to do procedures, it just opened a whole new door as far as you know the possibilities. I mean, we've interventional radiology as a service uses imaging to guide treatment. That's essentially what we do. And be it cancer, peripheral vascular disease, women's health, it's all image based. I got to tell you, Dr. Singh, we do a, a fair amount of medical and health related programs, segments like this. Every time we do it, I, I know I, I know it's not just me. Mm -hmm who's learning something. I know our audience is as well, and I want to thank you for joining us and sharing your expertise. Appreciate you. it. Dr. David Singh, appreciate thank it. You. One on one will continue right after this. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program, or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. There she is, Dr. Linda Sapula, eighth grade science teacher, beautiful Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Now, the doctor stands for? Doctorate in Education and Educational Leadership. It's educational Leadership. Now, that's really impressive. Why did you go on for your doctorate in the field? Um, ultimately, when I, my goal was when I grew up, I wanted to be a teacher of, for teachers. 
So a teacher I, for teachers. Yeah, I wanted to teach those coming into the, uh, choosing to be in the education field how to be great teachers. And I actually teach with the University of Phoenix also. Online. That's interesting. You're a leader in, in many ways. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, everyone we've had on in this classroom close-up initiative in partnership with the NJA, New Jersey Education Association, they're all leaders in one way or another. They wouldn't be on here. We're about to see a video from the classroom close-up series that you can check out on our sister station, our partners at NJTV. Uh, Saturday Morning Science, it is a super-duper terrific television series. I don't want you competing with us. But this is a Saturday morning television program. It is a terrific piece of video. We'll come back and talk to Dr. Sapula right after this. Let's take a look at the video. Okay. In five, four, three, two. Welcome to the Saturday Morning Science Show's Halloween special. Saturday Morning Science is a TV show produced by high school students hosted by middle school students who teach fun science lessons to elementary school students. You can say this and she'll do it. On the day we visited, the cast and crew were shooting their Halloween episode. For our first experiment, all you need is a graduated cylinder, water, a glow stick, and dry ice. The show involves all schools in Egg Harbor Township. It airs Saturday mornings on local cable access and helps students understand basic science concepts in a fun and entertaining way. As a science teacher and one of the presenters for the district professional development team, we realized that it seems like the elementary teachers aren't as comfortable teaching science to the kids. So we wanted to incorporate sharing science with them so it's easy to do in their classrooms. Linda writes a rough draft of the script and then works with other teachers in the district to finalize a suitable version for the elementary school audience. See, the ice is not melting. It's going straight into a gap. It's so to get picked for the show, I had to audition. They gave us probably around five paragraphs of like the introduction to the show that I said on this episode and all the other episodes. Okay. Now what you need to do is to take the string out of the bubble solution. I wanted to be on the show because one of my favorite subjects is science, and I love science. And as soon as I found out I got to, aud I got to audition, I thought it would be a great opportunity. And I love being on TV. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> there you go. Oh, the program also features turnkey professional development for teachers, available on the school district's website. Parents and students can also access additional enrichment activities as well. Turn off the lights and try this. You can't do activities like this in class every day, so it's really interesting to see how kids are doing new things and learning new things, and not just in school. We received the NJA HIP grant. We received $10,000 and we bought our camera equipment. We bought the iPads where we, we use for the teleprompters. We bought all the supplies for every show, the backdrops, the materials. Atomic Instaworms is another great way to introduce you to the chemistry behind polymers. I hope the biggest impact is that kids don't stereotype scientists. Like when you see them in the book, you see them the older gentleman hunched over with the lab coat and the pocket protectors and the glasses, that they realize that anybody can be a scientist. And that's one of the things I'm real big in my classroom. I, I want, as soon as you walk in my door, you're a scientist. Cheers. That is absolutely fabulous. It was How a lot of fun to watch that. That was very fun to watch that. What did you enjoy the most about that? Um, the learning experience the kids took away from it all. Um, it was it was a, a labor of love. I, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't easy. You know, school, three school teachers, Lynn Myers and Kelly Lenzo and myself, we came up with the idea to, to produce this show um, so kids can watch on Saturday morning so their learning continues, not just Monday through Friday. Um, we wrote the scripts. We, you know, the kids auditioned to be the hosts. We had so many great kids come out to be the hosts, to audition for the hosts that we had to have mm -hmm. three main ones and then we incorporated guest hosts in every week and and even the the younger kids the the, the students that were on the K to 3 students the elementary students they had to write in why they wanted to be on the show and it was competitive it it was and it was um you know now that we we produce six shows plus a best of and a blooper show which was very You have fun. a blooper show? Yeah, we do. And we actually even did a red carpet preview 
Get out of here. Of our here. first show. We invited all the parents <laughs> and the superintendent and everyone at the board meeting. We put down the red carpet and the balloons. And, and they love it. It was, it was amazing. When you first, again, you said you had some colleagues helping you put this together, but obviously you're a driving force here. What made you say, hey, we need to do this television series to teach science to elementary school kids? What made you do that? Well, I'm one of the district professional development leaders in our, in our school, and uh, every chance I get, I present hands-on science activities and lessons and boot camps for uh, K-3 to elementary teachers. And I know that in those grades, it's pretty much reading, writing, arithmetic. If I had my way, it would be science, and everything else comes in through science. That's in my perfect world, but um, I'll work on that. So I know that their expertise so much isn't in the science fields because they're not uh, highly, you know, um, they didn't major in that area. So I thought this would be a perfect way to produce these shows because it's not only shown on our local education channel on Saturday mornings, you can get to it through our uh, Egg Harbor Township website and any teacher can link into it and use mm. it for turnkey training, for professional development, for anticipatory you know, set information f to start a new lesson. And all the, all the equipment that we used in the shows, these te any teacher in the district can call me up and ask to use it in their classroom. So what you have created is potentially a model for anyone in the I state, in so. the country. There's no reason they couldn't do this. No. And again, you went out and got some funding. Right. Uh, remind folks, since it's, we couldn't do what we do if it were not for the, yeah, those who give us right. the dollars. So how did you do it? The NJA uh, Frederick Hip Foundation, we, we wrote a grant with, with them. Uh, and, and we received the grant I think two, a year and a half ago. And that's where the equipment came from, mm -hmm. the ability we, to do this. Yeah, we bought all the video equipment, the microphones, just, I, just like the one I'm wearing. I told your guy, this, I have this one. <laughs> um, teleprompters, we bought iPads. The kids use those as teleprompters and, you know. Before I let you out of here, what do you think it's done for the kids? Hopefully made them excited about learning science and that they realized that science is everywhere. It's all around them. Our, our, our ending phrase is always, you know, thanks for watching and remember science is all around us mm. because it is. There's nothing that you do that's not science related. But it's also taught them about the media, taught them about self-esteem, right. confidence, the ability to communicate in this fashion. It's done so much for them. Yeah, it's, it's especially the children involved in the production. They, they really, some of them were like, wow, you know, they got to see production of a TV show, so did we, because we're teachers. We didn't know the whole process between writing the script and, you know, we, we learned a lot through that. But got them interested in that different medium of not mm. just being in front of the camera, but what goes on behind the camera. I hope uh, people who watch us on one-on-one -on -one are not tired of me asking this question, but every teacher who's come through I ask the question. One through ten, how much do you love your job? Oh my gosh, I don't have a job. What I do every day I love, it's not a job in, in my mind. The day I call it a job, I need to retire. It's not a job to me. Enough said. It's an adventure. Dr. Linda Sapula. I want to thank you, congratulate you, and on behalf of all the parents out there who have kids in the public schools uh, with great teachers who make a difference every day, just want to say thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me on. Okay. Stay thank with you. us. One-on-one -on -one will continue right after this. Okay. Can I work for you now? <laughs> if you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. George Lascaris is president and CEO of NJEdge.net. Good to see you, George. Good to see you, Steve. Uh, your website will be up throughout this segment, but I want to make sure for people who do not know what NJEdge.net is, tell them. We are New Jersey State Research and Education Network. Uh, we were created in about the year 2000 to focus on technology initiatives to <clears throat> meet the missions of our members, which is predominantly all of the higher education institutions in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, we've built a very robust technology infrastructure to support the challenges that our uh, colleges are facing with technology. And we also interconnect um, institutions in New Jersey to other higher education institutions around the country and the world Put through that the infrastructure. For I, I per perspective for us. I, I moderated a conference a few months back, I uh, saw so you at. Um, a lot of higher ed institutions were there, and it was a discussion around this subject, but also the challenges facing a lot of higher ed institutions and the need to collaborate, the need to share services, 
with diminished resources, right? Yep. Why is it so important for higher ed institutions and other institutions, uh, educational institutions, to be linked in this way and not say, oh, I'll do it on my own? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. One is, I think some time ago, the President's Council in New Jersey recognized that there were things they would not be able to achieve unless they did it together. Leveraging economies of scale. Uh, we've saved um, you know, several million dollars for the colleges by <clears throat> everything from uh, group purchasing agreements. <clears throat> Give us an example of that. It sounds great, a group purchasing agreement. So instead of a college saying, we'll buy what on our own, they do what, they buy what together? Well, let's just take internet access. So if each college had, some schools had 20 megabits, 30 megabits, 50 megabits, putting all that together, we have a true economy of scale that I can do a bid and get, I can cut the price in half because of the quantity collectively across the members. Another example is um, long distance minutes, you know, because I pool all of that across the institutions, we can get the price for under a penny a minute. And so, you know, that's, um, that there's, there's other things. We, we've established a, a statewide uh, video conferencing infrastructure that allows schools to exchange uh, expertise of the faculty between institutions. And um, you know, we have some very good efficiency gains for the higher education institutions. A quick example, at Brookdale Community College, at one point they were getting a lot of demand for a nursing certificate program. Well, nursing faculty are expensive. However, Rutgers University in Newark has a, an outstanding medical, uh, nursing program and they offer all the way up to a PhD in nursing. So they worked out an arrangement by using some of this infrastructure that NG Edge supports. They could offer a two-year certificate program in nursing <coughs> using faculty from uh, Rutgers Newark. And in addition, the nature of the program was that the students did well, they would be guaranteed admission into a four-year program at Rutgers. So everyone doesn't have to have their own. Right. We had a, something similar with UMDNJ, University, University of, of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey and Ramapo College with a nursing program. So let me ask you, what about other institutions? We just talked to a teacher, middle school, elementary school. Can the same principle, the NJ Edge principle, be played out with educational institutions at other levels? Well, yes, I'd say nationally, we've had professors from Cal State participate in a bioengineering class at New Jersey Institute of Technology. They've been a guest lecturer on a frequent basis and <clears throat> we take care of all of the sort of video conferencing capabilities and that professor is as large as life in the classroom. It almost look, appears as though he's right there. Where's the funding come from the for your organization? Well, initially <clears throat> it was uh, a very different time back in 2000, <laughs> but during the Christie Whitman administration there was a $50 million bond initiative specifically earmarked for technology and education. Explain that, a $50 million bond initiative. Did voters vote on it? I believe so. And there was a, so it was a $50 million pot of money right. to go to, toward what? To improve the technology infrastructure across all of the members. Got it. And so <clears throat> the President's Council was formed at about that time. And I think they had the vision and the foresight to say that some other states had other not-for-profit organizations like NJ Edge that specifically catered to meeting the technology missions of their members. And um, so <clears throat> I was at Rutgers University at the time. I know. And we were, <clears throat> they had formed a technology advisory committee. We visited some of these other states that had done this a little bit earlier than New Jersey. And we looked at how they were governed, how they were structured, uh, <clears throat> what are the types of initiatives they focused on. And we produced a proposal for the President's Council. And they, there was a segment of that $50 million that was put into a set aside to create such an organization. The rest of the funds went directly to each of the colleges to upgrade their networking infrastructure because they were falling woefully behind. Where are we today? Like, where's your money come from today? From our members. Uh, meaning a college or university has to be a part of it, it has to be a yes. member. Yes, to be a member. And there's a, there's a reason why they do that. Right. They're not doing it just to be nice to you, they're doing it because it's good business. It's, it's good business. smart for them. Right. And for their students, I mean, for parents watching and for students watching, real quick, what's the benefit for them? Well, they gain uh, access to a world of resources. Uh, we've had uh, professors in Beijing, China that have participated at Montclair State University in a course. So we open a globalization experience for our students that they wouldn't have otherwise. 
Uh, there have been classes at Ryder University that have the American University in Cairo, and they've talked about uh, you know discussions about terrorism, about <clears throat> global politics, whatever they wanted to talk about, and it's um, it's a real expanding experience that the students themselves are able to take advantage of. It's essential that these connections continue, and as we said, that we, as we started this uh, conversation, George, each entity cannot afford to do it alone, mm -hmm. shouldn't do it alone, and NJEdge.net uh, makes that happen. George Lascaris, I want to thank you for joining us and providing perspectives and connecting all of us. Thank you, George. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for watching. Now let's continue the conversation about this and other important topics and issues on Facebook. Visit my page at facebook.com slash Steve PhD. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child, Wells Fargo, the Adler Aphasia Center, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work. And by Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. When you work in a public school, you're a part of the community. So when Superstorm Sandy hit, the school employees jump right in to help. The middle school here served as a refuge for people who were forced from their homes. We all pitched in to help. Custodians, cafeteria workers, teacher aides, mechanics, groundskeepers, all pitching in to help out. School employees are part of a team, whether it's to help educate our children or to recover from a terrible tragedy. That's why I'm so proud to be a member of the NJEA. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. And I'm Steve Adubato. Join us every week on New Jersey Capital Report. Because we'll ask the questions that you want and need answered. Airing on NJTV 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings.